Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ryan Ride Mechanic channel. How the heck are you doing today? Thank you for coming back and watching another video. I do appreciate it. Every time a ride breaks down, it's a small battle. It's a battle between man and machine. Who will win? Well, I was hired to make sure that we won every time. I was pretty good at my job, too. It was my job to come in and basically win where others have lost already throughout the day. But I like to win. Here's me winning a complex controls issue that we had on a ride. Profile 5. And dispatch button is pushed. That video marked the end of six weeks of troubleshooting on that ride. That was particularly gruesome. Uh, I also like to win other things. Like, here's a video of me winning a NASCAR race. For those of you who don't know, yeah, I used to race stock cars. So good old-fashioned American horsepower was really fun to do. For those of you on the other side of the pond, here's me winning an F1 race. And still the driver to beat, Max Verstappen wins the season opener. He takes the Bahrain Grand Prix. <laughs> Can't catch him, let alone get around him. Oh my gosh. You see that one race at the beginning of the season, 2024 season? That was crazy. 22 second lead. Come on, who's dealing with that, really? Anyways, rides break down a lot. Sometimes they can tell us what the problem is. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes we can figure it out and we get the ride back up and running and we win. Sometimes we lose and the ride wins day after day after day. Here's some stories of the time that the machines won. Amusement parks spend a lot of time doing PMs, and by that acronym I mean preventative maintenance. These are the preventative inspection and repairs that goes on first thing in the morning before the ride opens up every day. So PM is short for preventative maintenance, so remember that when I reference it. Plenty of parks spend even more time repairing your rides than they do getting their preventative maintenance done. When it comes to breakdowns, some rides are easy to repair and some aren't. I've seen mechanics push past their breaking point to the point where they end up wanting to quit at the end of the shift, or they just get really frustrated and have to storm off because they can't figure out what's going on. It's a really bad mental scenario. When the parks open, it's absolutely critical that we keep the rides up and running. This keeps people coming through the front gate. When rides are down and they're broken, uh, we have to put the name up at the front of the park, and a lot of times this will turn away people, and essentially the park loses revenue from that point forward. So we want to keep guests happy, guests in the park, so we want to keep the rides running as much as possible throughout the entire day, every day. For the most part, it's actually flat rides that end up taking most of the downtime throughout the day because there's way more of them. We typically have park is only like 10% roller coasters and the rest of them are flat rides and kiddie rides. So it makes more sense that they take more of the downtime. Uh, the flat rides are also much cheaper uh, cost wise. So there's actually less that goes into them and they're simpler. So there's also a lot less that goes into them. Great for complexity, but sometimes when you have faults and troubles with them, they really can't tell you what's wrong and they don't give a very clear explanation of what's happening with the ride either. It leaves a lot up to the operator to figure out what has just happened with the ride. Some smaller rides have a complex fault monitoring system and some of them have no fault monitoring system at all. They simply just stop working. I've worked on rides that were actually fairly complex and the ride actually only had about seven faults total for the entire ride and they really didn't tell you what was going on. So it was very confusing every time one of those faults did pop up. We were trying to figure out how the machine arrived at that fault. It was pretty complicated. There's been lots of times that the parks had rides down for days, even weeks, trying to figure out what the problem is. And at the end of it, you can sit back and like, man, all that problem was caused by that one little thing? That was crazy. I couldn't believe that one thing took the ride down for that long. 
Some of them are a little bit more complex and the downtime is kind of justified for that particular repair. Some of these problems may seem minor, but they're honestly almost impossible to find sometimes, which is really troublesome for maintenance. Some of the worst troubleshooting out there is signals that go through a single wire and are daisy chained throughout the ride. Now by that I mean the daisy chain is a series of switches put in place and you'll have one wire that comes up to switch number one, it goes in switch number one and out switch number one. And then that same wire goes to switch number two, in switch two, out switch two, and then repeats with three, four, five, six, and can go all the way up to whatever number. I've worked on rides that were, it was 80. 80 was a lot of switches. So in the center you have a slip ring stack. So a slip ring is a piece of conductive material that's been bent 360 degrees around the center hub where the ride rotates and it's conductive. So the slip ring has a shoe or a brush riding along the outside. So your signal comes from the control cabinet and typically delivers something like power out to that slip ring. It transmits through the brush and then starts going through that daisy chain. And then that daisy chain signal has to come back to a second slip ring make contact through a brush and back through the slip ring again and then it goes back into the control cabinet. Used really commonly on a lot of rides where it monitors restraints in the closed position. A lot of flat rides like to use limit switches to monitor the restraint in the closed position. So when you pull your lap bar all the way down, a lot of times it's very faint, but once you get it right down to where your waist is, you can hear this faint little click in the background. That is the limit switch changing state. So on rides where they don't quite know what's going on, they keep having people jostle around and say, everyone get up and like move over a seat and sit back down or something. There's a larger guest in the ride and that limit switch is not making. So what happens is they give the close command and the PLC or com controller sends a signal out through that slip ring. And then it goes through all 80 of those limit switches, 40, 30, 20, whatever it may be. And one of those switches somewhere is not closed. The ride doesn't know what switch it is. The operators don't know what switch it is. Sometimes it's really obvious. You can look around the, the gondola or whatever you're loading and just be like, um, um, oh my gosh, that guy right there. Yeah, that's the reason your limit switch isn't made. A lot of downtime on these rides can also be attributed to simply just poor troubleshooting on the mechanics end. Now, the mechanics know what they're doing and they know pretty well what they're doing. But a lot of times what happens is that the environment that these rides work in are completely dynamic. They're changing every day, every cycle, every load, everything changes. So a lot of times you get into these problems and some of them might be recurring problems, but sometimes you have problems that look like other problems, but they're not the same thing. There, there's plenty of times where you don't know what the problem is at all. So you can only do what's called chasing the symptoms. Well, the symptom is the ride is doing this one thing. So you just have to chase the symptom and you don't know why that symptom is happening, but it keeps happening. And a lot of times it's not until later on down the road in troubleshooting that that symptom, finally something else happens in the ride and the actual problem rears its ugly head and you could say, ooh, there it is that thing, whatever it was, maybe finally broke or shorted out or faulted the rest of the way, that thing was causing these other things to happen. And we were always focused on scenarios one and two over here when it was actually scenario 10 that was happening that was causing scenario one and two all the time. It's very, very problematic all the time with troubleshooting. It's called chasing the symptoms. But it is a great moment when you finally get that aha. That's it, that's the problem. So let's get into some stories. Now get ready, here we go. So we had an SLC that was doing this symptom that was happening for actually a very long time. The symptom of this problem, uh, which actually plagued us for a good three or four years straight in a row, was that every once in a while, the lift would slow down with the train on it and it would slow down to a crawl and then either suddenly speed back up as the train went over the lift hill or it would stall completely. And the motor would be sitting in the control room. The motor would be pegged at 400 amps on the DC armature and the train just wasn't moving at all. So it would slow down, come to a crawl and stop. 
and we didn't know what the problem was. Uh, we did all sorts of troubleshooting into it. Um, like I said, this this went on over years of troubleshooting. Uh, we tried to figure out what was happening. Each rehab, we did extensive work. We like would we took the chain apart. We thought it was drag in the chain assembly. So we replaced chain liner all over the chain. We replaced, uh, one year we replaced the chain itself. Uh, we thought it was a DC drive problem. So we bought a brand new DC drive from Vacoma to replace in the control room downstairs. Uh, we replaced the cabling going up to the DC lift motor. We replaced the tachometer. We replaced the lift motor itself. We rewound, which means to refurbish or repair the DC motor up on top of the lift hill. We did all this stuff and we still couldn't figure it out. And now this was coming close to the time of the end of my employment there because I was looking to move on. But uh, the last year and a half, somewhere right around there, I had I kept telling everybody, I said, it has to be, because we've, we've done everything else. We've replaced wiring motors, DC drives, we've replaced the motors, uh, the tack generator on the back of the motor. We, we've done everything. Like nothing is making sense here. So I'm like, it has to be probably the planetary drive up on top of the lift hill. And I talked with lots of people about that. I talked with vendors, I've talked with manufacturers, I talked with everybody. And I would explain the symptom of what was happening. And they said, they said gearboxes, these planetary drive gearboxes especially, they said they don't fail in that fashion. And what was happening is, is like I said, it would it'd throw down to a crawl and stop. And then we would st simply just go out and stop the motor, shut the lift off. We didn't have to wait a long time or do anything funny to it. We simply just hit the start button again, and the motor would pick right back up, and it would carry the train right back over the lift hill just like normally. And it wouldn't do this every day or even every other day. Sometimes it would go weeks, sometimes even months between doing it. So it was the, the time frames between it was really, really throwing us for a loop. We could not figure out what was happening. But when I talk with people about the planetary drive gearbox, they're like, it's not the gearbox. They don't fail in that fashion. I'm sure I probably have a lot of you sitting on the other side of this video right now saying, yeah, gearboxes, they don't fail like that. They're either broken, completely broken, or they're working just fine. Or if they're in that in-between state, they're making a bunch of noise or maybe running really rough, but definitely not like it's fine and then it's not fine and then it's fine again. They don't really work that way. So never could figure out what the problem was. And like I said, about four years of this intermittently happening at least 15 times a season, at least 15 times a season. Sometimes it would, it would happen day after day. And operations was putting a lot of pressure on us. Like, Hey, you guys need to get this fixed. And we were sitting there going, uh, yeah, we understand. We, we want to get this fixed, but we don't know what to fix. So I had left the park at that point in time. That was, uh, let's see, late 2018. And then I got a uh, message from one of the people I work with just shortly after I had left the park by a handful of months. I believe this was early 2019. I got a text message from him and it's got a picture of that planetary drive gearbox sitting in the shop. And I was like, what's going on? And they said, the gearbox broke. And I'm like, so how did it finally break? And they said, it just, it stopped working altogether. And then it's like, okay, so what'd you guys do? It's like, well, we got a gearbox from another park that just so happened to, they had actually just ordered a replacement planetary drive gearbox. And instead of going to that park, they actually rushed that gearbox over to my old park and threw it in that ride. And uh, they actually took the gearbox that was there and sent it out to a gearbox refurbishment company that knew how to work on these big planetary drive gearbox because they're very custom. And um, they took it apart and the, the company that was working with it said, oh, we see some worn components here and there, but nothing really bad. And they asked, well, what about this thing where it would suddenly just bind up and slow way down? And they're like, no, I don't think this would do that. But, but, 
after they replaced that gearbox and got the new one in there, it stopped doing it completely. So that was that was pretty interesting. Uh, from the control side, I I was swearing up and down it was something wrong with the electronics in the system. But I can only hold that so far until we replaced all the electronics. Once we had the drive replaced and the field windings and everything were new in the motor and all that stuff, at that point I could officially say it's like, okay, it's not electrical. It's not electronics. It's causing this problem. It has to be mechanical. But we had done enough mechanical all we was left was that gearbox and then they said no 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 gearboxes don't fail that way well guess what it failed that way so that was really interesting like i said that took four or five years worth of troubleshooting before the gearbox finally broke that was one of those moments where it's like yep the gearbox it didn't we didn't finally find the problem like oh look here's this worn thing in there the gearbox just finally broke the rest of the way and then suddenly one day it stopped it wouldn't move anymore so that was really interesting. That was one of those things that was, whew, man, there were some days when we just, we wanted to call it quits. Just, I don't care. Take the ride down. We don't care. <laughs> but uh, of course, the park won't let you do that. They're like, nope, that's a money maker. We need it up and running. So that's the other thing about rides. You know, you have a lot of, a lot of people pushing pressure on you to get the ride back up and running because while it is down, like I said earlier, you're losing money that entire time. Okay, we had a regatta. A regatta is a it's, a, it's a flat ride. It's a roundy round ride. It's just got 16 tubs that sit around a center sweep and it's got a bunch of arms attached to it. And it just, it's the sole point is just to sit there and spin fast. The tubs go up and down this little hump as it goes around there. Nothing really crazy to these rides at all. We had something go wrong in the cabling out to the motor. And we said, okay, we thought it was the motor going bad because the motor had actually been in the ride for a long time. So we thought it was the motor going bad. So we went out and we checked the motor. And the motor was actually still in great condition. It was indoors. It was covered. It's, so it was like, okay, it was in great condition. Something else was happening. So we took the wires off to both ends of the motor in the uh, cabinets and at the, it's called the pecker head of the motor, which is actually just to cover... It's an older term. I know some people say like, hey, you're dating yourself. It's like, yeah, okay. It's the cover on the side of the motor. It looks like a square junction box. And inside of there is where the wires from the motor come up. And then you terminate the wires from the ride or from the control system to that. It's called a pecker head. So we had taken the wires off on both ends and I had left its three phases plus two brake wires. Um, so I had left all the wires hanging off on that end, and I had left all the wires hanging off on the other end, and then I attached a megger to it. And a megger is a tool that we use that sends high voltage down a wire. Not super high voltage, about a thousand volts down the wire. And then you attach it to something like a ground, a ground wire that is measuring earth. And then what you do is you put a thousand volts down that wire, and it watches how much of that voltage bleeds outside of that wire. So you can find, it's typically used for motors, you're finding insulation that's worn down and that voltage is literally jumping between windings instead of making current going through the winding, making power for your motor. But it can also be used to check wires. In our case, what we did is I measured all the wires. And what has happened is I'll just use gen generic terms. Um, for the three phases, we typically use L1, L2, and L3. This could be done lots of different ways. It's We typically use L1, L2, L3. Um, U, V, and W are commonly used, and R, S, and T are also commonly used, depending on countries, places, wherever you're at. Turns, but L1, L2, L3 is kind of negates the rest of them. It's like, all right, don't, don't worry about R, S, T, U, V, W, it doesn't matter. One, two, and three. There you go. So I measured one... It was to ground, and it had a lot of insulation, so its leakage was very, very low. Number two to ground, hardly anything out of it. Number three to ground was almost a dead short. So it was like, hey, that's a problem. That's a big problem. So it's like something is wrong with the wire that runs to the motor. Okay, so we actually had to ride down for a couple of days because we were trying to figure out how the wire got to the motor. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So the ride was one of the first rides that the park had installed. And the plans weren't great because the, the civil plans, which would say where conduits and things like that go, um, they weren't really available to us because the park was really old. So I was like, okay, uh, let's, what do we do here? So in the control cabinet, I look at the five wires, go down the conduit, and then the conduit turns, and then they pop up on the other side at the motor, and the five motors, the five wires come out there. It's like, all right. So try pulling on it. You disconnect on both ends and just try pulling the wire on both ends. It pulled out like half a foot to a foot, and then it stopped really hard. Uh, well, that didn't work. Let's try it from the other way. So we went to the other side, and of course, each time we do this, you have to attach other pull cables and stuff to it because you plan on emptying the conduit and you leave a string basically run through there, and then you tie the string onto the other set of cables and use that to pull the new cable back into it. So there's time, that lots of time that passes between this because you're getting ready to do these processes. Um, so we went to the, the motor end and we're like, try pulling on that. And it's like that pulled out about two feet and then it stopped. And we kept doing that, zigzagging back and forward. And we couldn't figure it out. So it's a couple of days past, we had our trades crew, which dealt with only like uh, power and stuff like that in the park. Not so much rides. Our trades crew didn't deal with rides. They dealt with buildings. They dealt with power and stuff like that. But we figured that's what was going on. We needed the trades guys to come in and tell us where the conduit went. And we couldn't figure that out. So we had eventually one evening, we were out there working on it, and uh, we got it cleaned up really well. We kept sticking like rags and stuff down inside the hole on a, on a string, just cramming them down there and pulling them back out, trying to clean the conduit as best as we could, because I was looking for a reflection. I was looking for a reflection to tell me what was happening. We were shining lights down on both sides. Ne neither of us could see what they were. Um, we could push air, we took compressed air and blew it into the conduit and it came out on the other end. So it's like, okay, they're connected, which is great. One of the things like this was under concrete. So one of the things that I really thought happened is that the trees in the area had broken a conduit and caused the conduit to open up and move like that. And it was pinching the cable and we simply just couldn't move it either way. But uh, that turns out it wasn't the case because when I finally got the, the conduit cleaned out enough and I did get a reflection, I could see down at the bottom. We didn't have a good bore scope or anything to stick down inside there. But I could see at the bottom, the, I could finally see the conduit went down, down, and then it made a hard left-hand turn. Which is like, well, that's expected, right? Well, my problem was is that uh, the ride was actually to the right. So I was expecting the conduit to go down and turn to the right towards the ride. But in reality, it actually went down and turned left towards the street in front of the ride. And we were like, oh, there's another junction box somewhere. So there's a nice big planter out in front of the ride. And then there's the asphalt street. And then there was nothing else beyond that. So like, it's got to be in the planter somewhere. So it, we took another, it took us another couple of days. We're out there with sticks. Um kind of like rebar and stuff like that, which is filed down and like to a point where it's sharp at the bottom. And we were very carefully standing around and pushing these down into the ground, trying to find a hidden junction box that might have just had landscaping and stuff grow over it. Um, and we couldn't find it. So we kept checking all over. We couldn't find it. And then we actually contacted some people that used to work at the park and they had a lot of knowledge of what was going on out there and they said you know where it probably is it's probably in the street out there so we went out there and looked in the street and there's no boxes in the street there's nothing out there it's just smooth asphalt we're like nope there's no openings it's just asphalt out there they're like it's probably in the street there there's a, just asphalt there's nothing there and they're like no you don't understand they probably asphalted over the junction box Really? Really? Yeah, they just asphalted over the junction box. That's probably what happened. I say probably 
<laughs> I don't know what happened because in order to get the ride back up and running, because we had already been down for like four or five days doing this, um, to get the ride back up and running, uh, we opted to just, we ran an external conduit from the, it went underneath the control cabinet just like the original one did, but we put one right next to it and ran it just on top of the concrete because people weren't walking there. We ran it under the ride on top of the concrete through some flex couplings because it had to go up and over this, the ride structure and then it just ran into the base of the ride and then stubbed up from there and then we tied it in with the existing system. To that time when I left, it's like we still didn't know where that cable went. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's like the ride was down for almost a week just because one wire went bad. But that opened up the other problem. Like, well, we didn't know where that wire went or how it got back to the motor. So people don't think about that sort of stuff. It's like, yeah, those are some of the really weird problems we've run into in these troubleshooting scenarios. That was fun. We had a Vacoma boomerang in the park, and we were having this weird problem of between cycles, the ride would run just fine, and then the train would come back home and it would home. And then what would happen is as we let the catch wagon down from the top of lift one, and it would come down, and you know, catch wagon comes down a boomerang and then latches into the back of the train again, it would come down and it would start slowing down. It would just start getting slower and slower and slower and pretty soon it would just stall on the lift hill and it would stop there but the hydraulics were humming in the background it was putting out pressure to the lift everything was exactly where it was supposed to be doing what it was supposed to do but the, the catch wagon would just stop and it would do this fairly consistently so we were trying to figure out how it was doing that we had no clue how it was doing that. So we were in contact with Facoma. We were like, what's happening here? And it's a hydraulic system. The whole, everything is hydraulic. The brakes are hydraulic, the winch package, everything. There's big reversing valves. So you have half the system runs lift two, half the system runs lift one. And then of the system that runs lift one, half of it is designed to reverse and half of it's designed to go forward. And then half, and then part of each one of those system is designed to open and control the brake in that system. With the time lag between us and Vacoma, and we had other parks on the phone too, because we were like, hey, uh, we were asking them, because all over the hydraulic system, there's pressure ports where you can plug in gauges and actually take the hydraulic pressure off of there. I say, what's your hyd hydraulic pressure on all these things? We're comparing systems where it's like, okay, your guys is working, what's yours doing? Ours is not what's ours doing, and we're trying to figure out where the difference was. Because a lot of times, that's one of the things of troubleshooting. You can't necessarily figure out what's wrong until you know what's right. And a lot of the times on rides, that stuff isn't really documented that well. There's a pressure port there. It's great. It's got 4,600 PSI on it. That's great. Is 4,600 PSI correct? I don't know. What was it before that? Well, we had no reason to check that before that. So you had this pressure port sitting there that you didn't know what the pressure was the entire time. So troubleshooting like this helps us for future references because we actually went through and recorded all the pressure points. And when the ride was in operation, we recorded what those pressure points were doing while it was going this way, while it was going that way, when it was in this cycle, when it was in that cycle. So we gathered all that base data. A lot of people are just sitting there going, well, yeah, duh. Don't you do it? It's like, no, we weren't doing that. We weren't gathering base data. And come to find out, most parks don't gather base data off their rides like that. Um, it's not something that's very common because it takes a lot of manpower to do. And you can't justify why you're putting that manpower in there. Well, for the future. For the future, what? You're spending all that money on time and labor for what? The park sees no immediate return on that investment. So they're like, don't waste people doing that. Go do something else. So this catch wagon would continually come down. It would slow down, slow way, way down. And then a lot of times it wouldn't make it to the train. It would stall on the lift hill. So kind of like the SLC, if we turn the hydraulic system off and then turn the hydraulic system back on and then started lift one lowering again to bring that catch wagon back down, it would pick right up and go just fine. No problems. And come right in, connect to the back of the train, 
and probably run the rest of the day and maybe the next day with, with no problems. So again, when you add time to these scenarios, it makes it that much more complicated. It's like, why is it doing that? How is this? Why is this doing this so intermittently? We couldn't figure it out because it was our is there a time of day it was happening? Was this was the moon and the sun in the right orientation? Like what was going on with this ride? We could not figure it out. So working with Vacoma back and forth, it takes a took a very long time to do. This was again one of those things that probably took us the majority of an entire operating season to figure it out. Because Vacoma would say, What's this doing? And then we would go out there and we say, this is doing this. Well, is it in its failed state? Well, no, it's not. It's running now just fine. Well, we need to know what this one thing is doing in the ride's failed state, which means that we can't continue troubleshooting until it fails. That's one of the number one things that most people don't understand. It's like you can't troubleshoot something until it fails. Have you ever done this with your car? Maybe you have a car, your service engine soon, soon light comes on or something like that, and then it goes away. And then it's like, huh, that was weird. You take it into an auto, bot or auto shop and say, what's happening with my car? And they plug it in. They said, well, this fault happened, but it happened one time. You're like, well, what does that fault mean? And they're like, we don't know because it's not doing it anymore. It's the same exact thing with a ride. Unless it's failed, you can't really troubleshoot what happens. You can do shotgun repairs where you just start replacing parts left and right, hoping one of them does it, but you're eating up a lot of money and a lot of resources when you do that. And I know like for people at home fixing their cars, we don't want to spend a ton of money just on some mechanic's hunch that something might not be right, unless they have something to back it up. So it's the same thing with amusement parks. So... It would take forever, like this thing would, it would work fine for a week or two and then it would stall again. And then it's like, okay, Vacoma needed the pressure on point number 28 when it stalled. So we hop right out there and then by the time we got out there, it was working again. It's like, dang it. So that just draws out the time to troubleshoot Look further and further and further and further. Well, it took the majority of a season, but we finally got down to this one thing and there's a thing on a lift one on a lot of the Vacoma boomerangs it is called a brake rupture valve this valve is really interesting it's down at the bottom it's on the back of the hydraulic motor on lift one the brake rupture valve is designed to engage if you somehow lost the hydraulic system and the thing wouldn't run away on you basically because once you take the, the hydraulic pressure is not only lifting the train, but it's also controlling it in its failed state too. It's also letting us, okay, we're going to stop it. We're going to bring it back down, this and that. So the brake rupture valve is a mechanical shuttle that sits on the back side of the valve that says if the system went catastrophic and completely run away, it would basically kick in and start to govern the speed of the drum. So if it went run away on you completely and everything failed and your brake failed and everything else was messed up, hence the brake rupture part because the hydraulic brake needs pressure to open. So it's going to assume that you not only open the brake at that point, but somehow you stuck it open. Somehow. Don't know. But And then that drum starts speeding up because the train's coming down. Well, they put that hydraulic assembly in there to say like, okay it's going to govern the speed of that drum coming back out. Now, this is a catastrophic failure scenario, so no parks ever dealt with it. They're like, we don't know what that thing is at all. We're not touching it. The coma never told us to touch it. It's not in any procedures to touch it until ours started malfunctioning. And then it's like, it basically thought when the train would come back down, it basically thought that the drum was going into a runaway scenario. So the spool, the valve on the inside started to shuttle and move and it started to regulate the speed. Although we were just telling the catch wagon to come down at its normal speed, when it would start failing, that valve would start shuttling over because it thought it was going too fast. And because no parks ever dealt with this, Vacoma rarely dealt with it. Uh, it took a lot of back and forth between everybody 
to say, I think the brake rupture valve is bad. And then it's like, okay. And then Vacoma said, maybe it just came out of adjustment. Well, we've never adjusted the thing before. How do we know what the adjustment is? And they basically said, okay, well, do a bunch of tests, run it up and down a bunch of times. And then there is an Allen adjustment on the back. You put an Allen key in and then a lock nut that goes around it. You simply just open the lock nut. And while the thing is running, you twist that Allen screw and you'll, you'll be able to hear it slow down or speed up depending on what you're doing. So we went out there and it was running up and down just fine. We opened that adjustment screw up and then we don't remember which way it was, but we like started to tighten it and that drum started slowing down and the system started loading up under pressure exactly like it did when it faulted. We're like, this is it. This is what's happening. We're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, look at that. So we, we did that and then we said we didn't want to adjust it in its working state because we didn't want to go too far. We didn't want to cause a safety hazard at all. So what we did is we actually waited again until the ride failed again. And then when it was failed, it was down, it was trying to come down, but it was stalled. This time, instead of stopping the hydraulic system, we went out there, cracked that nut loose, and started to adjust that Allen key. And then as we, as soon as we started back in tension off that Allen key, that drum just just picked right back up and started going back down. And then right when it just backed not even an eighth of a turn of that wrench, we just, just backed off enough to where that thing sounded like normal. And then we locked it back down from there and we said, we're done. And then after that point, we had never heard from that again. Now, there was a problem, which is why it came out of adjustment in the first place. So the solution was once we found that we, that adjustment had worked, the solution was we ordered a new brake rupture valve from Vacoma. But obviously Vacoma stuff never broke before because they didn't have one on the shelf. They didn't know if anybody had one on the shelf, so they had to have one from the original manufacturer of that particular valve, remake it according to spec, and send it to us. That shows you how often their stuff fails. <laughs> when, when nobody ever has heard of this failure before, and then it suddenly is like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> But that, I mean, that took a year. That took a year to troubleshoot just a slight adjustment on the back of the brake rupture valve. Absolutely incredible. Took up so much time. Handful of downtime calls. We probably had about 30 to 40 downtime calls for that spread out over that year. Uh, so not great, but it's kind of what it was. At this point in the video, if you haven't already, please make sure you like and subscribe and give me some comments down there. Let me know if you've got any fun stories to add on to these. And then let me know if you want to see something for topics in the future, too. I'm always up for new stuff. I've got a list of things that I'm making, but sometimes somebody says something and I'm like, oh yeah, let's do that one real quick. That, that really sounds like fun. I do enjoy getting that information. You guys come up with a lot of good ideas for videos, so... Let me know if you got them. You can also email me at ryanthereidemechanic at yahoo.com. Let's get back into the video. Okay, so we had a crazy bus, and this was manufactured by IE Parks. Now, it's nothing against the manufacturer. It's a very common design that's used between lots of different manufacturers. It's a kid's ride. It's got a bus that's go around two arms. There's also a crazy sub out there. There's all sorts of rides identical to this, so... You can copy and paste this towards everything. When we got this ride and it was brand new, they were going along and operations called up and they said, it vibrates. And we're like, what do you mean it vibrates? So like once you get to a certain speed, especially with load and stuff, it vibrates. We don't know why it vibrates, but it's vibrating. And it's like, okay, so maintenance will go out there and we look at it. And we go, okay, well, I don't really see anything wrong with it, so we turn it back over to operations. And then later, they call up and say it's vibrating again. So this kept getting worse and worse to where, and when I say it getting worse and worse, the problem actually wasn't getting bigger. What happens is when these problems arise like this where we can't fix them right off the bat, is that the operations becomes more in tune with the problem. As before, that when that very first time that problem came up, that very first operator was sitting there going, I don't think this is supposed to be this way. I think I'm going to call the ride down. Before that point, operators have heard it, 
but they didn't really understand if there was or was not a problem, so they didn't even bother calling it down. Not like, not shame on them, nothing like that. But it took a long time to just acknowledge that something was happening. And then they started calling it down. And then the more they called it down, those operators were able to pinpoint it quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker to then towards the end when we knew exactly what was going on, the operators could just start it and it would go three quarters of a rotation and be like, there's the vibration right there. So we had this thing up and down so many times. Uh, we were out there troubleshooting it. We were running crews out there working with it from all aspects late into the night, early into the next morning, trying to figure out what was going on with this thing because it was a newer ride. And we, we did not understand. We're like, why are we having so much trouble with a new ride? We had the park the manufacturer in contact and they were trying to help us out. But when you're dealing with things like that, it had a motor, went through a T-shaped gearbox, and then that went out to two other gearboxes, which went through two ring gears, which went through two arms with counterweights. The whole thing was down and had a sheet metal facade on it. So there was so many things with harmonics and vibration that could be happening. Everyone was just, they didn't know where to start. Nobody knew where to start. So we were doing all sorts of things to this each night, every night. The night crew guys were running till like 2 o'clock in the morning, which they were normally supposed to leave about 11 o'clock at night. But they were running out there till like 2 o'clock in the morning. We had four mechanics out there. One guy was just sitting there running at high speed, low speed, forward, backward, trying to think of everything. We got more mechanics out there. We got weight into it. We were trying to figure out if weight figured out into this. It was, there was a loading in the front versus a loading in the back versus the center, heavy versus light. We were trying to figure it all out. We couldn't figure it out. Like, what is going on? One night, one night we were running that thing. The ride had been down for like a couple weeks and we still couldn't figure it out because night shift was troubleshooting it. Day shift would try, but honestly didn't have the people night shift did. So hardly anything happened on the day shift, and the park didn't want us troubleshooting it with the uh, area open. So that made it harder. We couldn't troubleshoot it during the day. Um, so we went out there, and we were running it at nighttime. And the night shift manager at the time was out there. He was actually operating it. And the thing was going around. They had it going full speed in there. And then something just boom came apart in the back. A bunch of loud bangs and the thing just came to a stop. Well, crap. That's not good. Ran around back there. What happened? Now, there's a on those rides, there's a safety cage on the front. In case any of that stuff comes apart in the back, those drive shafts and, uh, and gears and sprockets and stuff... In case any of that ever fails, there's a safety cage back there to prevent stuff from flying out. Because typically these things are put up at fairs and things like that, where you might have people walking close to the back side, you know, on the other side of the midway. You might have people walk in there and you don't want them catching shrapnel off of some rotating assembly that came apart. But in this case, everything worked like it was supposed to. The safety cage worked like it was supposed to. We actually had the pulley, the drive pulley assembly came off and we're like how did the drive pulley assembly came off and we looked back up and we're like well the drive shaft that it attached to that came out of the gearbox the entire shaft was gone what and so we got down got the pulley which was all like had a bunch of dings and bangs in it now and we're looking at it still has the drive shaft on the inside as the shaft the input shaft i should say to the gearbox sorry it still has the input shaft sitting inside of there. And we're like, how the heck did that happen? And we look at it. Now, if you've ever seen a failed shaft, what it looks like is that out of a nice round diameter like this, like three quarters of it will be nice and shiny. And then like a lot of times what happens is that a quarter of it, like ours, was rusty. And what that means is that of that round shaft, there was a crack right along that side. And that crack had been there for a while, and porosity had gotten on the inside, rust. So it was starting to rust on the inside of that shaft right there. And then eventually, that three-quarters finally just gave out, and it suddenly sheared. And that's the reason why that 
side is shiny. So you have a si shiny side and a rusty side. Rusty side. That typically comes apart on one of the, a shaft failure like that. And we looked at it, so not only we would look at it like, oh yeah, you could see where the shaft was cracked. And then that's where it broke apart right there. We were like, oh my gosh. Can't believe none of us caught that for a while. Granted, you know, I'm working on it at nighttime and stuff like that, but we're still like, none of us caught that. What added insult to injury on that one is that we started going back over because we were taking pictures of everything left and right, send them to the manufacturer and anyone else who had a ride like that trying to figure out what was happening. In one or two pictures of that assembly that we had sent off to the manufacturer and to other parks, you could see the crack in the picture. It's like it's right there. Once we knew what we were looking for, we're like, there's the crack right there in the picture. We sent to everybody. No one caught it. <laughs> but so that was from the get go. That's when it's cracked or when it started to open, at least. That's when it started vibrating. Because when it was first went in operation, it didn't vibrate at all. And then once it started failing, it started vibrating. And the operator was like, this isn't right. And then after a while, it was like, yeah, the vibration started getting a little worse. Honestly, just a little worse. It wasn't bad. And uh, we were just like, huh, well, maybe they should just like turn the music up to the area and keep running the ride. Uh, we didn't quite know what was happening, but they kept calling it down time and time again. And it's like, okay, so we kept trying to figure the whole thing out the entire time. We couldn't figure it out. Not until one night, and it was like 2.30 in the morning when it happened. It just broke apart completely. And we had a whole bunch of mechanics sitting in the bus with a bunch of weight on top of it and stuff like that. Trying, We were trying to load the thing up to figure out what was going on. And the night shift manager was absolutely at his last wit. Um, he had the other manager on the phone, and he's like, I am, that was before the failure, you know, he was ready to quit. He was just like, I'm finding another job, F this place, I am out of here. Because he just, he could not take dealing with these constant calls like that down all the time for this thing. And the last, uh, I think the last week that we were troubleshooting that ride, we never even opened it. We were just, all right, we were, we were just trying to troubleshoot the problem itself. So we just held the ride down rather than trying to, try to get a little more life out of the ride we just held it down and kept it down that entire time we had a Hus frisbee that was sitting up there and the Hus frisbees are really interesting they're old rides but they use two drive tires underneath the keel that moves the gondola and swings it out from side to side and the way these work is that when the drive turns on it says I'm gonna turn on going direction one and then it does, and to accelerate, it says it uses its base tachometer speed, whatever that input is from the motor, and it adds 15% to it. But before, when it's at like under a certain amount of pulses per minute, it puts a value in there because basically the ride stopped. So to go one direction, it says we're gonna start out at 20% power going clockwise. So it turns on and goes 20% power clockwise. And then once it gets to that speed, it takes the tack generator readings and says, okay, and then it's watching what the gondola is doing dynamically at that point from the motor. So it's going, okay, so, and then it switches direction and it runs it back the other way. And then once it runs out of speed, it switches direction, runs back the other way. In our case, what we had was as the gondola had changed speed and was coming back down towards that wheel, that wheel was still turning the opposite direction. So the gondola was coming this way and the wheel was still turning this way. And the two would meet with each other while they were going opposite directions. And what it would cause is all the time, as the gondola hit that drive wheel, it would just go big loud chirp. And the gondola would slow way down and then start to pick up speed again back the other direction. And it would do that a couple times per cycle. Well, operations got tired of us just saying, like, we're working with it. We're going to, we'll try to figure it out. We'll try to figure it out. And uh, we were working with it. We were doing all sorts of troubleshooting in the background. And we couldn't do it. 
operations finally got the point they're like we're going to refuse to run this ride and they had every right to so they did they refused to run the ride you know by that point we had all sorts of upper management keyed in on it also and like we're sitting there going look we're trying we're not just twiddling our thumbs we're we're legitimately troubleshooting and trying to figure this out but we had done all sorts of stuff we were back in the control room we had replaced io control board cards uh, we had replaced like almost the entire PLC worth of those cards. We had rebuilt the guts to the drive motors down inside there. We had done all sorts of stuff and we could not figure out what was causing this to stay the other direction like that. And we had uh, myself as the controls guy up there slash supervisor up there. We had other mechanics up there we had the maintenance manager out there. We had the maintenance director out there. Uh, the director and the manager were both extremely familiar with these Hus rides, and they really knew what they were doing. They brought a ton of experience to the park with them. So we were, we were using everyone's brain trying to figure out what was going on. There was all these signals happening back and forth. We had to start dealing with, like, is it the signal from the tachometer on the back of the DC motors? that's giving the signal to the drive? Is it a conflict between what the drive is doing versus the absolute encoder at the very top of the ride that actually measures your arm position as the arm swings back and forth? So we're like, what is happening? And of course, because a lot had to deal with that absolute encoder at the top, we would have to climb up there each time to do anything with it. We tried tightening it up we tried putting rubber around it to make sure it had like absolute zero play on it and we tried doing all this stuff and it takes a very long time to do not to mention when the park is open we, all of our resources are gone so we again that was one of those rides we sat down for like a couple of weeks on and every day that ride wouldn't open and i remember one time we we thought we had it and we like we thought we had it about after doing just tons of tweaks and troubleshooting. It seemed like it was working good. So they asked me and another mechanic to go up there. And they said, put 80 cycles on it, just like a ride operator would. Now, if you're a ride operator, much respect to you. Because uh, that was one of the most boring things I've ever done. But I was also loading and unloading ghost people. <laughs> because <laughs> there was nobody there right the park was closed it was during the week time when no one was there but we would have to mimic what operators do so we would go up there at the beginning and we would start and we would open all the restraints up and we'd go up make sure they were all open and then i would literally come back being the dispatcher i would literally come back and open the gate and then i would count as ghost people walked by and once about 30 ghost people walked by, I told the next ghost person in line, I said, sorry, you'll have to wait till the next cycle. And they were fine. Like most of them were pretty cool. Some of them gave a little feedback, but whatever. And then we went up there, waited a couple seconds for ghost people to finish sitting down. And then we went ahead and closed the restraints down. And then myself and the other mechanic had to go around and manually check all the restraints. Mimicking a ride operation cycle as best as we could. And then even occasionally, I would throw in there some ghost person got on with a ghost camera. And I'm like, hey, you can't ghost film on the ride, so you have to go put that in the ghost lockers. So we open the restraints back up and let the ghost person go up, put the ghost camera away, come back, sit down. Then we had to check everybody again. And then I'd run it. I put 80 cycles on that ride. I am like 80 cycles that took the majority of the day I was going nuts at the end of it because, again, nobody there. I mean, at least operators have people to kind of interact with as they're doing this. Nobody there. Done with that. It's good. It's good. Open the ride back up. The next day, crew comes in. We're up there while the crew is warming it up because we are just like, we are there. It's done. We're, we're good with this. Cycle number one. <laughs> right back into that tire there was almost some quitting on the spot right there like are you kidding me are you kidding me we ran this thing for a freaking day with problem free and then cycle number one it does it for the new operators oh my gosh flash forward past some more troubleshooting and another week worth of everything down 
we decided to, we were into shotgun repairs. Again, that's just where you just replace stuff just because you don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Just replace it. So we finally came down to the tack generator that was on the back side of swing drive number one. Not number two, number one. And we replaced it. And then it started working beautifully. And we're like, really? So we actually took that tack generator back off of that drive, put the old one back on, and then we really started watching the signal on that. We hooked an oscilloscope up to it to watch the actual waveform from the tack generator come out. And as the motor spun, yeah, the wave looked really choppy coming off of it. And it had all sorts of problems with it. So we were like, ooh, look at that. So we went ahead and replaced it. We ran a bunch of cycles, gave it to operation, said we're very confident about that. We replaced this tack generator on the back side of the motor. And now the motor is behaving all sorts of brand new. And they said, okay. They're like, we still want our ops to come up there and we're going to run it for like an hour on our own before we bring people into the in the queue. Okay, that's fine. They did. An hour later, that ride went up and running. And it was fixed at that point in time. We're like, all right. It was a tack, tack generator. We went back and added a, uh, I think it was a three-year, three or five-year PM onto the ride, which it was never mentioned before on there. But I think at a three-year, we put a PM on the ride that just said replace the tack generator on the motor because we didn't want that happening again. That was some bubkiss. We had a Intamin T U-shaped suspended impulse coaster. And this ran the old fiber optic IEA net system. The net system, the IEA system, was two things to the ride. It was a encoder uh, to figure out where the ride was on the track. And it was a speed emulator that told you how fast the ride was going. So it not only took position of the train, but it watched how fast it went at the same time. And then it had safety systems overlaid on top of that to ensure that what the net system was getting was in fact correct. So it was a very complex thing and the thing worked off of a closed fiber optic loop, fiber optic loop that went all the way around the ride. So each IEA net module got its own signal going into it, coming out of it. And it would work off of something like a token loop. It would add its information to it and then send it down to the next one in line. And then if it had to go past 50 meters, it would have to go through a repeater module. And then the repeater module would add its information and send it off down the line as well. Fiber optics, very fun to deal with. Uh, this was industrial fiber optics. So it's actually just a piece of one millimeter plastic that's in the center. It's not true glass that's in there. So they were having all sorts of troubles with the ride and I was on vacation and I had a high reputation for being able to troubleshoot these rides and get them back up and running. I was on vacation and management just started throwing people out there and not really asking the questions of what these people were doing. They were just kind of like, seemed like they were just filling time. And I say they seemed like they were just filling time because... I got back from my vacation. I had spent like a week and a half on vacation. And I got back from my vacation, showed up to the park, and they're like, this ride's down. We need you to go troubleshoot it. Oh, okay. I haven't really even checked my email yet to find out what's happening. But I got to rush out there to this ride. What did it break down last night? And basically found out, no, it's been down the entire time you've been gone. Like, really, you guys call me for every single thing out there, but this was one of the times no one called me up to at least just ask which direction to go into? Okay. So I went out to the ride, and I'm like, what's going on? Actually, no, first I stay and I did check my email because every night the crew would send a turnover, and the turnover would state everything that happened that went on in the park that particular day. And if a ride was down, like that one... They would say, this is why it went down, this is what happened, and this is what we did to try to troubleshoot it. 
So each day that I was gone, I would look at the turnover for that ride and look at what they tried and tried doing uh, for that thing. So I put on my troubleshooting hat. I go out there. What's the first thing I do is I know that all the information on turnover, the first thing I do is I go in the control room and I take all the IEA net sensors that are in the system and that program allowed us to take up to two net sensors out of the loop at a time. Like one was malfunctioning, you could just go into the computer and take that one sensor offline. And then you can go in another point in time, take another sensor offline as well. And the ride would still run. But you couldn't take three. Three was the, the too far. So two was your maximum. So I went in because they were taking sensors on and offline like crazy. I'm going to try and it seemed like they were just shooting in the dark. We're going to try this one. Try that one. Pull that one back off. Pull that one back off. And doing. I understand I've been to that type of troubleshooting myself. It's, it's really not fun. It's like banging your head against the wall slowly. So I went back there and I put all the net sensors back in line and I'm like, okay, everybody go. And then I went back to the ride, turned it on, went through the startup procedure and just started running cycles on the ride. And then I, right within the first two cycles, I got a fault. I'm like, okay, I go in the back and I see what the fault is. The front, but the control panel where you're standing, it'll tell you that it's got an IEA net fault. That's all it knows because you have to go to the back room and it will tell you the IEA net sensor, its computer back there, will then tell you a more in-depth explanation of what that fault was. But not like really cool, like, hey, here's all the information you need. It's just slightly less cryptic at that point in time. It's like, uh, IEA net system fault, okay. And then you go back to on the back and what's it say? Oh, node 28 fault. Anything else? Or sometimes you'll get my favorite one. Uh, node 21 interpolation timeout error. Oh my gosh. If you've ever worked on one of these systems, and I know you guys are out there too. If you ever worked on one of these systems and you see that interpolation timeout error, it's like, uh, I've spent a lot of time staring at that word. <laughs> um, and this is for an inductive ride. I don't know if I said that, by the way. <laughs> Um, so I went back through and it said something like it was like, I think an in interpolation timeout er error on node 28. Well, the ride's a token loop. So it starts out at the PLC and starts sending its token down. It gets down to node number one. Node number one writes its info on the signal and then sends it out to node two. And then back to the up. Ch -ch 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 -ch. So when you have this interpolation timeout error on whatever the node number is, I don't care what number there is, whatever number it is, you take that number and you go minus one backwards, right? That's your problem because it's always sending the signal forward in the loop. So I went there and, and that was also in the turnover a bunch of times was something like that node 28 timeout or blah, 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 blah. So I went there, I got the same thing I'm like, okay, they had a new net sensor in the control room that was being passed around the ride and had been put in so many different spots while they were trying to troubleshoot stuff. So I went to node 28 out there and I looked at it and yeah, node 28 was a nice shiny new sensor that had already been installed because obviously they were hyper-focused on that particular one because they're like, this is where all the errors are coming from. I went to the one right next to it that was 27. I opened up the top little junction box lid in there. There's moisture on the inside of it. And I'm just like, eh, that's not good. Those things can't have moisture on the inside of them. They're highly sensitive fiber optic encoders. I mean, like, <laughs> moisture and them don't mix at all. So I took, I took that one down. I powered the system down and everything. I took that down, undid its fiber optic and its control wiring and everything, put the new one in its place, and those you have to address them on the top. So you have to address them to their new location, put everything back together, made sure it was nice and tight and sealed. And then I turned the system back on, 
and instantly threw out a problem with node 27. And I was like, well, that's the one I just worked on. What the heck? Like before I even initialized the system, I threw that out. After all that, I had gone up there and done that. And when I tightened the lid back down for no node 27, the little tiny fiber optic line, which is only about a millimeter in diameter, I had accidentally pinched it underneath the lid and cut the fiber optic in half. Oh, okay, so I had to cut a new end on the fiber optic and then polish it back down. I have to use a meter to check light intensity coming back out. Tagged on like another two hours to my morning. Like, all right, got that all down, put a new cap on all that stuff, plugged it back in. Luckily, there was enough cable to do that. <laughs> um, turn the system on, and then I started running the train. And I started getting cycle after cycle after cycle out of it. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And then after like 20 cycles, I called up and I said, hey, because I wasn't running the crew at that point, I was just troubleshooting. I said, hey, I need someone to come down and PM the ride. That way we can get the ride back up and running. And of course, at that point, it was like, uh, nope, there's no one left to PM the ride. So I was like, oh my God gosh okay so now i have to change from my uh first i in the morning i took off my uh supervisor hat and put on my controls troubleshooting hat and now i had to take off my controls troubleshooting hat and put on my mechanic hat and now i had to go over and inspect the ride and then get it back up and running which was fun so i got that back up and running so yeah it sat down for like a week and a half while i was on vacation just to come back and like within hours I had the problem troubleshot and like, there you go, back up and running. That's just, management should have made more calls at that point in time to, to get someone other than me on the phone to say like, hey, this is what's happening. What do you think we should do with this? And somebody else could have told them, by the way, look at the sensor that's right in front of it because the signal gets passed through that sensor to the next one. But whatever. Uh, so it was a handful of issues like that on that particular ride, which is also one of the things that caused it to go down for a while while we pulled new fiber optic into it because the fiber that was there, it was installed in like mm, 2000, somewhere right around there, 2001. I don't know. It was It was before my time. So it was installed around that time, and I was just like, well, that fiber that's in there is getting tired. It's getting UV beaten and stuff like that. So it's like, we just need to pull new fiber in this stuff. I ended up buying new fiber, which is industrial fiber optics. I ended up buying it from IGUS, which is a really good company for uh, control stuff and things like that. Bought brand new fiber, pulled it into there. Apparently, I was one of the first parks to do that, too, because I, I told another park that I had just refibered the ride. And they were like, jaw dropped on the ground. They're like, What? You pull new fiber into it? How did you do that? And I'm like, oh yeah, I just got this stuff from uh, from Igus, and I put that in there, and they're like, really? I'm like, was that such a pain? And I'm like, it was kind of a pain because we had to do all these little things to it, but here are the pieces I bought, and here are the parts, and they're like, well, we're gonna do that. I'm like, I highly recommend it. Funny enough, you know, I had these 50 meter long runs of fiber optic between nodes and setups, but then in between the two sensors, which were typically always right next to each other, there was only about a one meter less than that, like a 0.7 meter piece of fiber optic between the two nodes to communicate from one to the other. The shorter one, that little 0.7 meter, looks like two feet long, somewhere right around there, piece of fiber optic, that was the worst fiber optic out of all of them. The 50 meter long ones that go from the ones from you know 50 meters apart, those are perfectly fine all the time. It was the little short stubby ones between the nodes. Those were in the poorest condition. Like we saw the biggest change of improvement by replacing those. I think we're about done on this video. I've got more stories as well. So I think I'll go ahead and make the next part to this and release it in a part two at some point. But uh, yeah, part two coming later. <laughs> These... Uh, these stories being incredibly complex and taking as much time as they do, they, they really do 
wear down the mechanic themselves. So it's it's a rough it's a mental strain when you have rides down for a long period of time. The mechanics feel it, the crew feels it, and then the park starts to feel it. Um, it's kind of like being sick. It just it runs its way through everything and it's really not great at all. So the next time you see a ride that's been down for a while and you and you might see mechanics standing there with a sad look on their face trying to figure out what's happening to the ride or if they stand around with a confused look on their face like they don't understand what's going on with the ride, just let them know. Say, hey, thanks for trying and doing what you do. That We do appreciate it, getting the rides up and running. So I think that's going to do it for this video, though. I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic. Make sure you like and subscribe, share, do all that stuff. It does help me out, and I do appreciate it. And if you want to do your part in keeping these rides running smooth, make sure you do the one critical thing, which is staying off the air gates. Bye.